Stars Dynamic Duos podcast, where we interview dynamic duos of pop culture. Our dynamic duo today is Wendy Peeney and Richard Peeney, the creators of the long-running iconic series ElfQuest. Welcome, guys. Uh, Hi. Welcome to you, Brian. Glad to be here. When we had, when we found out that we were kind of you uh, guys as our guest, I was thrilled because I've written so much about uh, ElfQuest over the years, and it's great to have you here so I can actually ask some of the things that I've written, uh, had questions about over the years. Well, well, that makes it really interesting for us because there'll probably be questions we don't usually get asked. Oh, I, I mean, I, I open up with is circa like 1965 is when comic books started getting in the mainstream as being read by college students and stuff like that. And people in the mainstream media started writing about comics, wondering why are college students and adults reading comic books at that point? Mm -hmm. And as anytime a little mystery like that comes up, conspiracy theories follow. And so people were concerned that maybe people were trying to get addresses of little kids versus the comic book pen pal lists. Oh my God. So the, com so the comics code actually came in and asked every company, please stop publishing addresses of the fans who write in. Really? Well, that didn't happen in our case. Well, DC, it DC Comics agreed. Archie, all, everyone, the only one who wouldn't agree was Marvel Comics. Oh, well. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. goodness. And <laughs> that's something we never knew. And of course, naturally, that became a rather important fact when Wendy wrote a wonderful letter to Silver Surfer speaking mm -hmm. about the humanity that she felt was lacking in the current Silver Surfer series at the time. So this I'd just like to hear both of your perspectives. Uh, Wendy, how many letters you must have gotten in response to that? I, and Richard, I got... <laughs> just how you reacted to that letter. <laughs> well, I got dozens of letters from guys who wanted to meet a girl who read comics because back then there were about three. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was one that intrigued me, especially one that I answered. See, I never knew what you just revealed, because at the time, this would have been very early 1969, so I would have been 18. I was in my freshman year at college, and I was a Marvel zombie long before that term of art ever got invented. So I didn't see letters columns in other, I didn't see it in DC Comics. And I knew that letters in Marvel had the addresses attached. So there I am, and I'm reading this issue of Silver Surfer, issue number five. And in the back, there were a number of letters and there was one that uh, struck me um, for two reasons. One, it was quite, philosophical in nature, it was wondering about, as you just said, you know, man's humankind's inhumanity to this alien beset upon figure. And two, it was written by a girl. And um, I suppose I was like any one of those dozens of other uh, guys who wrote. Um, but I was also honestly intrigued by a letter that didn't wonder who was stronger, Thor or the Hulk or the thing. So there was the address. I sent off a letter. And what he did to intrigue me was he was the only one who said, I really liked what you had to say in your Silver Surfer letter. But if you want to know more about me, you have to write to me. And I promise you surprises await. So he he knew what to say to intrigue a, a young a young girl. <laughs> um, I knew I, I knew nothing about comic book marketing back then, but I guess I must have known something instinctively because she wrote back, and not only did she write back, but she sent a drawing that she had done, a uh, full color uh, 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 drawing, not sketch, 
a fully rendered drawing of Triton, the character from the Inhumans. And I just was gobsmacked by the fact not only did she write back, but uh, uh, she was clearly a very, very good artist and, and has only gotten better. <laughs> That's great. So, so that was in a pen correspondence that lasted four years and then uh, we decided uh, enough is enough. Let's uh, let's get together. We got married in 1972 mm -hmm. and just a few years later gave birth to this thing that has lasted 45 years. Yep. That's right. You've never happy, left home. <laughs> happy belated uh, anniversary. That's right. 50 years. Amazing. Right. Uh, so it's interesting. It's then a few years later people were still fascinated that people read comic books at all, adults. And that uh, le leads to, in 1975, the Mike Douglas syndicated talk show did a episode about adults reading comic books mm -hmm. and brought Phil Suling, the, the great direct market uh, uh, pub distributor, on with Jamie Farr from MASH, who was mm -hmm. a big comic fan when he was a kid, and of course, as the big surprise, they had Wendy show up as Red Sonia. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, Do you remember uh, anything about that recording of that episode? Oh, well, plenty. Uh, <laughs> actually, actually, Phil tricked Mike Douglas by telling him that it was going to be a superhero. Mike Douglas was expecting Captain America. So uh, when I came storming out of the green room door onto the stage, Mike Douglas was very shocked, and he was uh, apparently really disturbed that my my uh, lack of uh, of a full costume might uh, offend his his more conservative audience. But the cameraman loved it, and uh, <laughs> Jamie Farr loved it, <laughs> so uh, it it was tremendous fun. And and one of my favorite stories is that a couple of years ago. We went to a small horror convention in New Jersey, and Jamie Farr was one of the guests. Oh, wow. And we brought a photo of Jamie and me and Phil and Mike Douglas, and um, I held it up to Jamie, and I said, do you remember this? And he went, oh, sure, I do. And then I said, that's me. He said, you were Red Sonia? <laughs> So he asked me for my autograph, and I asked him for his autograph. It was a lot of fun. That's great. What's funny is you got to do, uh, I believe a few years back, uh, you got to do a cover for the Dynamite Red Sonia, right? No. Oh, mm -hmm. I thought I thought, it, I thought thought you did one of the variants. I'm sorry. I guess I read that wrong. Mm. Um, so speaking of, you had Phil Suling there on the show. And yes. he obviously must have, he played a, pretty major role in the history of ElfQuest, right? Oh. This certainly he yeah. did as as uh, many, if not most, if not all of your listeners will or should know. Uh, back in the early 1970s, Phil Suling was one of the major movers and shakers in getting the direct market right. up and running which is the, the you know seed from all from which all comic shops direct shops uh, uh, now uh, sprung, and uh, we began ElfQuest. Uh, we were working on it in 1977, and um, we didn't publish that first issue ourselves. We had a small independent publisher do the first issues called Fantasy Quarterly, issue number one, and as it turns out, one and only. <laughs> um, but we knew Phil and Bud Plant, who was the other of the two West Coast, right? yeah. West pioneer Coast. distributors for, right. into the direct market in and those days. The reason they knew us was because they were familiar with my career as a science fiction and fantasy illustrator right. that had been going on for some years prior to this. So they knew I had a reputation. They knew that I had, you know, that um, that my work was known, and so it was it was easy for them to take a chance on it. We we approached them both and said, "This uh, comic book is coming out. 
that we've created and Wendy has written and drawn, uh, will you, you know, would you be interested in distributing it? And on the strength of what Wendy just said, they took the entire uh, first print run, which was 10,000 copies, which was kind of for an independent comic back in those days, amazingly huge. But we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> um, and, and, and it sold out within a month or two. Mm -hmm. And that was so encouraging and so financially rewarding that we were able to go on and then begin self-publishing with our own company, Warp Graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, so we put out the second issue and third and the numbers just kept rising and rising and rising. And it was a very heady time, but um, it's why we're still here 45 years later. We've never What's had- What's fascinating to about that fantasy quarterly number one is that the backup story is Dave Sim, right? In in one of the uh, coincidences of independent comics publishing, Dave was at the same time uh, launching his uh, title, Cerebus, and we had no idea he was doing that. He had no idea we were doing ElfQuest, but it is of cosmic irony that <laughs> uh, the very first appearance of ElfQuest does contain in the center uh, not a Cerebus story, but a story that was uh, illustrated by Dave Sims. So it was our our, our first and only, uh, 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 I don't know, double date, if you want to call it that. <laughs> so at that time, Richard, how did you, how do you become a comic book publisher in 1977? <laughs> there is no how-to guide at the time. No. There is no how-to guide, and uh, we had no idea. Uh, we just knew that we wanted to get the story out there. Um, it was an intriguing story. Wendy told the basics of it to me uh, about a year before we began working on it. I said, "This is this is." really intriguing. Plus, you got to remember this is 1977. Right. And in 1977, Star Wars came out. And suddenly, science fiction, fantasy, and by association, comics were really not only just acceptable, but potentially really profitable to do. Right. Um, Wendy has been a storyteller all her life. And so we thought, geez, maybe the climate has changed just enough so that we might have a shot. Not knowing a thing about it, all I could do was go to the yellow pages. Oh, really? Um, you know, the real yep. uh, thick book yellow pages with a copy of Bud Plant's First Kingdom and Mike Friedrich's Star Reach. Right. And I looked up printers and I went to printers locally and I said, can you do this? And they either said yes or no. And the ones that said yes, I, I worked with. So Wendy did the art and we would take the pages usually at five o'clock in the morning to the printer. And a little while later, there would be 10 or 20 or 40,000 copies bound up in covers. And that's, and we knew Bud and Phil, so we had distribution. Right. And that's how I became a publisher. <laughs> it was like Little Red Hen, do it yourself or don't do it at all. What's amazing around 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 77, also they there was that brief token uh token uh push for Marvel and DC started doing a lot of but however, for whatever reason, why do you think Marvel and DC weren't interested in ElfQuest? It, it seemed that they oh. just passed up this huge opportunity. I think primarily because of the drawing style, because ElfQuest, uh, we like to say, and others say too, is known as the first American manga. Right. ElfQuest was the first comic published in America to be, to really, really show influence from Japanese comics and anime. Um, I, I had been kind of, America's first raging otaku <laughs> since I was 10 years old. Uh, I discovered um, anime through a, a, 
uh, a film by Osamu Tezuka called Alakazam the Great. And uh, I was 10 years old when I saw it, and it completely changed my idea of how to draw. And I began to draw like that, and I began to look for any material uh, that was from Japan. Uh, I got really interested in Japanese culture. And so when the opportunity to do ElfQuest arose, it seemed like a natural fit to draw these fantasy characters with the, the large eyes and all the hair, which is the way <laughs> most uh, anime characters look. Um, uh, you know, it, it was just a natural fit, but I was also strongly influenced by Jack Kirby. I was gonna say, the mention of Triton, when he mentions Triton, I was, yeah. I was just about to say that you have that mm -hmm. beautiful melding of the manga and the Jack Kirby. That's exactly right. And um, so even though there was uh, influence from traditional mainstream comics in my work, uh, it was too strange looking for Marvel or DC to be interested in it. They called it, they called it peculiar. <laughs> they said it's just too peculiar for us. So. <laughs> and the, ris the reason at all we went to Marvel and DC is that I didn't want to be a publisher. No. I didn't know how to be a publisher, but when they turned it down, and and Mike Friedrich and Bud Plant also turned it down. Um, the only real viable avenue left was to learn how to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was a learning curve for me too, um, how to tell uh, the story uh, sequentially, um, uh, camera angles, uh, layout, um, again, I used my influences from Japan, particularly Osamu Tezuka, for uh, how to lay out a page, how to uh, bring the drama out in a quiet scene, and uh, how to put the maximum movement and excitement into an action scene. Um, it just, it seemed to click with readers at the time. It We sort of caught lightning in a bottle. Uh, ElfQuest filled a need that existed at the time. And one of the things we're most proud of is that we brought in uh, a large female audience, right. uh, which, which no other comic at the time had done. But one of the things that I think we're also proudest of, Wendy said, had used the phrase, and, and we have heard it from other sources, ElfQuest is the first American homegrown manga. Mm -hmm. And I did a little research and discovered that this is at least 20 years before the manga craze right. hit these shores. Absolutely. In the late, in, well, it was around 2000 that American artists started doing actual manga comics but we were there 20 years earlier i know uh, in in uh, it was in the early 2000s that you started to see japanese influence in mainstream comic artists work in superheroes you started to see a more edgy um um angular angular more attention to line work uh and and uh layouts became different as well. It's exciting. I mean, you know, the Japanese in some ways have it all over us as far as, far as um, exciting ways to tell a story in comics. What's interesting, early in the 80s, as you say, when you hit on that nerve, as it were, you also had the fandom, the, the ones who love to dress up like, say, Alpha Quest characters. And I just mm -hmm. wonder, your background doing some cosplay in the 70s, do you think mm -hmm. that had any impact on the way your designs just seem to be so well realized? It's not something that, it's something that someone clearly could wear. Is, well, thank it, you for saying that. That's that, well, actually as a costume designer, I, I had been doing costuming since I was about 16 years old right. because I started out in sci-fi and fantasy fandom and 
attending science fiction conventions and exhi exhibiting my art, but I was also very active in the uh, masquerade. The word cosplay didn't exist right. until many years later, but we called it costuming or masquerading. And I had been do doing it since I was about 16 years old. So when it came time to design the characters for ElfQuest, it was something that I had already been doing for many years prior in, in the characters that I designed for my covers and in interior illustrations for Galaxy and If. Uh, they were all science fictional or fantasy. Right. And um, and the way a character looked, the, the way they wore their clothes was always pretty essential to me. Well, so, it definitely, yeah, it definitely yeah. translated to the ElfQuest characters. Well, yes, and the fans did pick up on it, and they they did seem to find the costume designs pretty easy easy to duplicate. That had its expression, of course, in 1981 at San Diego at the Comic Con. Um, I like to think of that as the year of the elf at San Diego, mm -hmm. uh, because they have since the very beginning had a, a an amazing um, masquerade, uh, usually Saturday night, and uh, people put together wonderfully intricate uh, costumes or now cosplays. Uh, but in 1981, Elfquest had been going for about three years. I think we're mm -hmm. nine or ten issues in. And... Um, that year at the uh, costume competition, two groups of fans showed up. One of them was about 50 or 60 strong. The other one was smaller, maybe 30, all dressed up as ElfQuest characters. They wow. completely commandeered the stage. <laughs> and it was amazing for us yeah. sitting in the front row in the audience. It was. Do you remember the first time you saw an ElfQuest cosplayer? Oh my goodness, uh, it's possible someone sent us a photo. I really don't remember. I just know that uh, the strongest memory I have is of 1981 where you couldn't you couldn't even turn and look anywhere without seeing an elf. It was we, it was tremendous. As, as ElfQuest became more and more well known, we got invited to more and more conventions, large ones and small ones. And I'd be willing to bet some money that uh, before that Comic-Con in 81, we had been in maybe 79 or 80 to, to a, a, a local or a regional right. show, and somebody would have shown up in uh, a costume, uh, an ElfQuest uh, cosplay, and uh, we would have been as thrilled to see that as we were in San Diego. Here's the point, though. Um, some of the best feedback you can get as a creator is when the fans show your characters back to you. Yes. Um, and when you when you see that not only do they get it, but that they can incorporate it into their own persona and their own creativity. And um, that never, ever, ever gets old. We never get tired of seeing uh, wonderful costumers uh, portraying our characters. So, some of the ones from Europe, uh, Russia and and um, the the North countries, the Scan uh, Scandinavia countries are, are just unbelievable. But I think there's oh, we've always had a great relationship with those fans because uh, elfin folklore is just permeates uh, Europe and parts of Asia. So that early fandom has got to be amazing because nowadays we're so used to the idea of instant feedback. Uh, social media will have an answer. The issue, the moment an issue comes out, you'll have people on uh, Reddit or Facebook or whatever. While in 1979, 1980, people would have to send you a letter with postage stamps mm -hmm. to give oh, yeah. their opinions. Yeah. And, and that's why I just wonder about the first uh, cosplay because it's that tangible response yeah. of we putting this out there and you now know the impact is there. It's got to be an amazing yeah. feeling. Well, you know, it, it, costuming as your favorite character was nothing new to us. I, we, we were part of uh, Tom Fagan's famous Halloween parade in, in uh, Rutland, Vermont, as uh, the Vision and Crystal. So oh, yeah. we, 
we knew about portraying a character that you loved. So when we saw fans starting to portray our characters, it was kind of like, my gosh, you know, we used to do this when we were fans and now we have fans doing this for us. It's really <laughs> kind of a full circle experience. And it, it's, it's funny you mentioned, you know, snail mail, because it's true back in the day, ElfQuest only came out three times a year. So there were four months between issues. And that is an eternity in the digital age. Mm -hmm. But we were all used to the notion that you put an issue out and over that period of three to four months, we'd get dozens, sometimes hundreds of handwritten or typewritten letters with uh, in envelopes with stamps on them. And um, it was a continuous, not instant, and not flooding, but a continuous, continuous intravenous drip of, of feedback yeah. Yeah. that was very, very nourishing. And what I'm finding more so in the last year or two than in the past couple of decades, people are starting to write letters again. I don't know about any other comics, but they're starting to write letters into us about ElfQuest. And that is just so incredibly gratifying. Yeah, it's charming. It's nostalgic uh, to see handwritten letters, handwritten fan letters with little drawings and things like that. And it really takes us back to the our earliest days. It's like you said, if you take the time to do this, it takes nothing to you know click like anymore. But if you take the time to handwrite a letter, mm -hmm. there's a a contract there. There's a relationship, even though it's very, very indirect. Well, this, I think this says something about ElfQuest fandom. Uh, over the years, we have really paid attention to the nature of our fans. And it's quite different from other kinds of fandom. Uh, the, the people who are attracted to ElfQuest tend to be um, marginalized in some way. We have a really large LGBTQ plus audience. Uh, we have a really large neurodivergent audience. Uh, we have, uh, again, as I said, lots of women readers and women have always experienced being marginalized. So what, what happens is that they find themselves in the story and in our characters in a way that I think a lot of other comic fans don't necessarily relate to the comics they like. Um, ElfQuest is very personal to a lot of people. And I, th I think when something's personal to you and you want to communicate with the creator, maybe writing a letter by hand is a more personal way of reaching out. Um, so I, I think handwritten letters is, is kind of expressive of what kind of fans we have. And I guess as an independent title too, it almost felt like that there's a, a greater sense of not ownership, but community, I guess you would say. Well, well yeah. That's, that's a very important word mm -hmm. to us because um, for all of ElfQuest 45 and counting years, uh, community is one of the uh, uh, of found pillars of the story of ElfQuest, the tribe, the different family. groups, the family. different families. Mm -hmm. um, and as Wendy said, uh, a lot of our fans just find some sort of identity or, or comfort, if you will, uh, in the story. So we are always aware of trying to build community between us and but our readers. To be honest, that's not something we actively had to do. The right. ElfQuest community grew uh, on its own. Um, and uh, there, there are some, quite a few of our fans have been with us from the very beginning and they're still with us, but we're, we're getting newer readers all the time. And uh, one of the things that Richard did that, that I just think was the greatest idea was uh, at a certain point in the mid 2000s, he started the project of putting just about every 
page of ElfQuest online to read for free so that new readers could discover it and catch up on the story without having to scramble to find the various comics online. And it gained us a whole new readership. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think particularly of younger readers, and that's something we're always looking for. Well, that also came about because Marvel and DC were starting to sell comics online. This was right. beginning of, mm -hmm. of, you know, the monetization and, and micro payments and whatever. And it has always been much more important to me as a co-creator and as a publisher that we have more new readers than that we make a couple dollars. That's right. And so there's about, I don't know, eight or 10,000 pages that I had to scan <laughs> from, from the Seriously. comics. Um, right. and it, took, it took a year and a half to do this, but all of that stuff is on there and, and you can read it. And I'm, I'm, I love that people give us feedback that, Thank you for putting that on there. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know if mm -hmm. I could find the back issues. Some of them are mm -hmm. very expensive, but you let me read it. And now I want more. Yeah, even now on the ElfQuest fan page, we get new newbies who say, hi, I just discovered ElfQuest and I don't, you know, I don't know where to start. How, how can I catch up on the story? And it's so much fun to tell them, well, you can go right here to <laughs> ElfQuest.com. And um, very often they will come back and say, oh, my God, I had no idea. <laughs> we, we just love new readers who come up to us at conventions and, and say, I only just started this story and it's amazing. Where has it been all my life? And we say it's been here for 45 years, but welcome. Welcome to the tribe. <laughs> what I love about the, the setup on the ElfQuest.com with the readers is not only are the issues there? But as you note, you even, there's like a guide. These are the ones that, you know, these are, you maybe start here, maybe mm -hmm. these sure. might be extra, that sort of thing. I think that's a, a really nice uh, help for new readers. Well, that, that was a very conscious decision because over the years we have, as I said, published, oh Lord, it, 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 30 or 40 collections of books and hundreds of comics. And uh, there is a, a skeleton, a, a core story right. Right. that involves the Wolf Riders that starts at the very beginning and has a direct through line mm -hmm. to uh, conclusions. Um, and, uh, uh, but we took many side trips and we had some spin-off titles right. and, um, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for somebody who's new to get the basics and then discover the, uh, the side dishes, if you will, <laughs> from the main course. What's interesting is uh, when you describe the concept of ElfQuest to Richard originally, Wendy, it was you had a beginning, middle, an end in mind, right? Yes, pretty much. Uh, it was a skeleton, right? Uh, all the all the side trips that we took on the ribs of the skeleton <laughs> came as we developed the story along, but. Um, I just, I, I had an idea about uh, a persecuted tribe of fantasy characters who look like elves, who want to find out what their origins really were, where they really came from and where they really belong. And the character that we brought forth to be the exponent of all that is Cutter, right. the, the leader of the Wolf Riders, the chief, and ElfQuest, uh, the, the 45 year arc of ElfQuest it, right through to the end of Final Quest is his hero's journey. Right. And boy, does he succeed. <laughs> boy, does he, <laughs> boy, does he manage to answer the questions they all had at the beginning of the story. I guess that brings us to the topic that a lot of people ask, which is, we have a final quest. 
But Mm -hmm. when I hear that, anyone who's been reading genre knows final usually means (laughs) just for that specific story. Right. Well, in our, in our case, final does mean final in the sense that in comics, I, I'm, unfortunately, comics fans these days take it for granted that if a character dies, he's going to get revived. Right. He or she is going to come back. So they never take it seriously and they never get to feel. They never get to feel what really happens in the story because the character dies and they go, oh, that's sweet, but, you know, they'll be back. In ElfQuest, that's not so. Right. When we bump off a character, they stay (laughs) bumped. (laughs) And uh, so we plan these things incredibly carefully. And Final Quest really was the final appearance of a number of characters. Right. A number of characters, yes. And... um, that is why we really felt it, it extremely important to bring out a coda to the story called Stargazer's Hunt, because the two main characters of ElfQuest are Cutter and Skywise. Right. Cutter and Skywise. Yes. <laughs> Cutter is my elf. Skywise is Richard's elf. And so at the end of Final Quest, Skywise is left without Cutter. Right. And uh, there were many, many questions in people's minds about what happens to Skywise now. I mean, this is well, awful. What, what's going to happen? Not, not only that there were questions in, in readers' minds, but there were questions in Skywise's own Absolutely. mind. His, his companion, his best friend, his soulmate um, is no longer with him. And he has questions that he never got to ask, so never got answers to. Mm -hmm. And even though the hero's arc of Cutter, chief of the Wolf Riders, was known from the very beginning, Mm -hmm. um, the notion that there needed to be, as Wendy calls it, a coda, an epilogue, Mm Um, so that Skywise could answer or find answers to those questions became of paramount importance once Final Quest was done in 2018, 40 years, um, to the day. To the day, Um, yes. Yeah, and and we sat down with Dark Horse, our publisher, and said, "Hey, hey, Final may sound very dire, (laughs) <laughs> but wait, there's more. Right. And uh, that's how uh, Stargazer's Hunt got born. And uh, it what? it's not even a month that it, this has been out. It's not I even a month, now. It's no. It's the 23rd, I believe, uh, right? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, um, the, the story of Stargazer's Hunt is, is full of, of, you know, that road is, is full of potholes because it was – uh, conceived as an a, a eight-issue eight issue miniseries. And it got started in 2019 very, very, very too soon. After <laughs> I, too soon after I finished Final Quest. I was totally burnt out from Final Quest. And here comes this new assignment. So... <laughs> yeah, but, 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 you know, the story will not be, you know... You can't stop the story. So uh, Wendy and um, we we did the story and Wendy and her, not assistant, what's the word you like? Sonny Strait is far more than my assistant. He started as my apprentice back in 2001. And he has been with us on this journey of of finishing the, the heroes, the hero's journey. And um, Sonny, oh my gosh, he wears so many different hats when we work together. Um, he, he likes to say that he's my finisher because I will send him pages in different conditions. Right. Sometimes he'll get, he'll get full pencils. Sometimes he'll simply get a rough layout. Right. And whatever condition the page is in, he will bring it to, to full finish, including colors. So in 2019... The three of us 
started in on Stargazer's Hunt, and the first three issues came out bi-monthly, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And that takes us to February, March of 2020. Oh, my God. <laughs> and suddenly the cosmos goes <laughs> boom <laughs> and shuts down the world. Um, uh, issue number four had already been delivered. It came out months and months late. Mm. Issues five through eight never got to see life as individual floppy comic book issues. Um, Dark Horse worked with us to bring out two uh, soft cover right. collections, four issues each, which were really, really nice. But the story and all of the hard work uh, really wanted expression. Mm. So uh, we and Dark Horse uh, worked together because last year, 2022, this year, 2023, it's our 10th anniversary We've with Star, uh, yeah. with Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. So everybody really worked hard and pulled together to come out with this gorgeous hardcover edition of the entire story with extras and all sorts of goodies inside. Mm -hmm. um, it's available on Dark Horse. It's available Barnes & Noble, Amazon, whatever. Um, but you want some inside dirt? Ooh. Of course. Okay, the inside dirt is we, we were talking about, well, you know, you were asking, is final really final? There are so many clues and hints of stories. So many clues. Come. So many clues and hints. So many <laughs> clues. <laughs> well, so many. Is... <laughs> Just as over the last 30 years of ElfQuest, there are clues in those early stories oh my goodness, to yes. what happens in here. Because we, mostly Wendy, because she keeps all this stuff and I, <laughs> how she does it, I'll never know. I don't either. She knew, <laughs> she knew things that needed to be, the groundwork needed to be laid down because stuff was going to happen in Stargazer's Hunt and Final Quest. And... She loves dropping clues so that years later we can go back and say, oh, you think we're making this stuff up on the run? <laughs> well, what happened here? Go back to issue number three in 1980 and look at panel six on page 12. Yeah, uh, we are our wonderful uh, social media um, wizard, <laughs> David Misajewski, just loves to do that every once in a while, to post a page and say, Hey, you know, look here. Uh, see how this relates to what happened 20 years later? <laughs> I loved about that in the original series. Um, mm -hmm. I loved how, again, you had this whole mapped out so far in advance mm -hmm. that I remember, like, there'd be clues. I remember there was, what, like a, co like a uh, cover for some, not, not comics journal, but something like that, that references issue, like, three, four years later. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Actually, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Is that the, the blue one with, with Skywise and Tamane? Well, yes, that was a comic journal cover. That was a comic journal. Okay. Yeah. 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 We, uh, we hinted at that possible romance. But, oh, yeah, my years gosh. Ahead of, yeah. 20, over 20 years before it happened. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, what I loved also is amazing when you had the original books because you have see, your letter column was so important back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, all letter columns were more important back then. But what I loved was you'd have the fans guessing what would happen. Yes. <laughs> well, because because Elfquist is a more or less self-contained and more or less linear right. story and universe. Um, we were able to keep track better of where the story was going, even though we took side trips. Of course. Yeah. When you have a huge universe like Marvel's or DC's and you've got multiverses and, and you know, Earth 5,276 <laughs> million um, 
we never had that. We had we, we had seven or eight hundred characters, but even that was manageable by comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could uh, 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 drop hints for future stories, and the fans would be able to follow that from the previous stories through the present story. And we also decided to give a lot of space to the letters as they came in, yes. because as I said earlier, people would write and they would write three, four, five page letters. Yes. And we just wanted to share those thoughts with others and keep that creative feedback loop going. And he's just a hideous tease. He, he's you know, <laughs> just in real life. And so he loved to tease them. You know, he would print someone's speculation and, and he would just spin <laughs> an answer to them. Which would be completely false and misleading. Yes. But I would love to make it sound so reasonable, you know, that you thought you were going to get it next issue. Uh, no, no. No. So. What I love about the current Stargazers uh, is that we get to see Skywise as, as you say, it, we had the hero's journey of Cutter. Now yes. he has his hero's journey. Yes. And it's that strange thing when you get the the Sancho being the star <laughs> of the of the story. That self doubt is such a major part of Skywise's story. Yes. And it's so insightful. And as you say, this Skywise is more Richard, but you've been writing him for now forty five years. Do you feel um, you know Skywise as well as Richard, or? That's a brilliant question because I had to rely on Richard for this so much. Richard's contribution to this is enormous. Um, we had an outline, we had a treatment, but at every step of the way, I had to ask him so many questions. I was constantly asking him, what would Skywise do here? How would he say it? I know everything about Cutter because Cutter <laughs> speaks for me. But it what Skywise thinks deep in his heart uh, doesn't always come to me naturally. And I might write something in a certain way that conveys the idea, but it, it took Richard to say it his way to make Skywise's dialogue sounds so natural here. Skywise is in a new role here. He could always be Cutter's sidekick. He could always riff off of Cutter and be the comic relief and all of that. Here, he he has to express himself more fully, uh, but he still has to be Skywise. Right. I think one of the symbolic things about the story in the artwork is that Skywise doesn't always appear as as the same size. Right. Sometimes we see him in his traditional elfin wolf rider size. Right. And then other times we see him as he transforms into a high one. He can do this at will now, but it's interesting how he never quite stays either small or tall. He he seems to vacillate, and that is part of what expresses his doubt about who he really is now. See, because in Stargazer's Hunt, for the first time in his now immortal life, he's on his own. Right. In a way he's never been, be he's been apart from Cutter at times, traveling or questing or, or whatever. Or kidnapped. Or kidnapped. <laughs> uh, but here he is completely on his own. And that's just one of the facets of the arc he has to go through and to determine just how he feels about that and what he's going to do with that. It's, it's kind of funny because huh, this is a coda to Final Quest. It is an epilogue. Um, and Final Quest wrapped up now five years ago, and we still get responses, usually on social media, from people who say, 
I bought Final Quest, but I haven't been able to bring myself to read it because mm -hmm. I know what happens. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's five years. There's no spoilers anymore. Um, and they just don't want to face they it. They just don't want to face it. And we tell them, say, you know, Stargazer's Hunt exists in part to wrap up, not wrap up, but to, to but to close a chapter in Skywise's story to to give him closure. But it's also to comfort you. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. And 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 allay your fears about Final Quest. So mm -hmm. you really should read Final Quest and then yeah. crack into uh, Stargazer's Hunt. Yeah. And and. That I think is kind of a powerful incentive to uh, to get people to read this story that they're afraid to read. I think so. And then when when someone writes us and says I I can't bear to read Final Quest, and we encourage them to uh, just as Richard says, and then go ahead and read Stargazer's Hunt, then we hear back and they say, Oh, oh, I get it now. It's not the end. Life. Life doesn't end; it changes, right. it evolves. But, but as as Cutter's spirit conveys in the story, it it's done, but it's not finished. Nothing's ever finished, and that's pretty much <laughs> that's pretty much Elf Quest. Yeah. It's it's that's done, but it's never. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's why we were able to say when we announced Final Quest, fans freaked out. He said, "Final? What do you mean final? Did it mean no more? No, 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 no. It doesn't mean no more Elf Quest. It means a certain Story. very specific finality." Yeah. yeah. Sonny Strait uh, said something that I thought was really powerful. Um, he said, "You know, we're we're doing something very." very cheeky here, very daring. We're actually attempting to tell a story about heaven, but with no theology. Right. You know, <laughs> a lot of the story takes place on the star home, which is a kind of a depiction heaven. of paradise. Right. And the, the characters that live on the star home can exist in pure energy form or they can exist in physical form. They can choose to be whatever they want to be, which is literally um, a vision of heaven where there's no physical danger, where there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no hunger, because you've, you've evolved beyond the, the need of sheer survival which was the Wolf Rider's story to begin with. The the story begins with the very basics of just having to survive in a world that's out to kill you. Right. And and now the story has has reached the point where where many of the elves have achieved their heaven, their safe home, the thing they were always looking for. But Skywise, he's still restless. He's he still wants more, and he still needs more. An important part about Stargazer's Hunt that people should understand is what's an amazing aspect. All this conflict, the violence, there's what? One being dies in the story, right? In Stargazer's Hunt. It's no, there's no act like a bird, I'm saying. <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> someone someone does fire a pistol and yeah, wounds so right, right, That's right. about the extent of it. <laughs> and it's so amazing that there's all this conflict without mm -hmm. that traditional idea of conflict. Thank well, you. Thank you for pointing that, that out. That is a very, very astute observation. One of the things that we mostly, Wendy, have tried to do in ElfQuest over all of his history is to take tropes things that are so commonplace and so often used as storytelling devices through literature, but in our case, throughout comics, to take these stereotypes and then just turn them on their head. Mm -hmm. um, all throughout Elfquest, you're going to see stuff like that. Um, well, in, in the very beginning, you know, in Cutter, you have Conan sweeping the the slave girl up on his shoulder and <laughs> right. so in the very first issues of of elf quest cutter you know 
hauls Lita up on his shoulder. And the minute he gets up on the hill and he thinks they're safe, she turns the tables on him a hundred percent. You have to show the bad behavior so you can show how it can be flipped on its head. But I think, uh, just to get serious for a moment, in uh, one of, I, not one of, the most powerful example of turning a trope on his head is is how Cutter finished his story because some of our fans were were shocked and horrified and said, oh no, it, it can't be like that. He has to go out in battle. He has to, you know, be swinging his sword and rah, rah. No, we never, n- not from the very beginning did we plan it that way. We wanted to show that we can't choose how we exit the world. It's not the dying, it's how you meet it. Right. And so he he didn't choose what happened to him. He didn't want it, but it happened and he faced it. And people get to see that whole beautiful, beautiful process of, of acceptance rather than you know going out with sword flashing and taking out as many people as you can with you which is the conan the barbarian way of doing things we had an entirely different idea of what happens to your hero when his journey ends and we wanted to show that in in all of its beauty and most of our fans got it and most of our fans were very moved by it but I think I think it's still t- taking some of them a struggle to accept that he didn't go out like a, a sword flashing, uh, you know, Zorro. <laughs> <laughs> it, w- it was far more beautiful than that. I hope you felt that way about it. Well, the funny thing is not to knock Stargazer's Hunt at, with a very nice story as well, but... Mm. I don't think Final Quest had a sad ending. Bittersweet, no, no. perhaps. No. But it, you mentioned people worrying about reading that last issue. It is not a sad ending. It's, well, I mean, you know, it's bittersweet, but not sad, I would say. Every, Thank you. Uh, I, I, we agree, but we have learned over the years that as many fans as we have, that's how many different reactions we get whenever there's a story or an event in a story that's particularly powerful. And this is one of the, if not the most powerful events in all of ElfQuest. And we have, we have learned a thing ourselves. It's easy to have the reaction. Whoa, excuse us. (laughs) Um, It's easy to have the reaction as a creator when you've done a story and someone and a lot of people react to it in a way that's very gratifying and Mm -hmm. some react to it differently it's very easy to have the reaction of wait 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 what did you miss don't you get it Mm -hmm. what we have learned is that everybody's reaction is different and everybody's reaction is valid for them Mm -hmm. and we do our best i hope uh, if somebody says, I just can't read it because I'm afraid to say, understand that, but give it a shot because we think you will find it's not so fearsome as you're thinking right now. Going back to my Japanese anime and manga roots, since I was a young teenager, I had been reading stories, at, I mean, in Japanese culture, they don't have the same fear of death that we Westerners do. And they have no trouble killing off characters right and left in their stories, even their most even their most famous heroes. You can pretty much expect them to go. Tezuka, Osamu Tezuka was a cruel god. He was like, you know, when he, when he was done with a character. So I grew up on that kind of story. I loved the gravitas. I loved that the stakes were so high in a story because you never knew if a character was going to make it out of the story. And I wanted people reading ElfQuest to have that edge of their seat feeling like, 
listen, we know that R Wendy and Richard, when they take a character out, they're out. Right. So, I mean, what's going to happen here? Who's, you know, like the first death we confronted our fans with was one eye and not right. even, not even we could face that very well. <laughs> well, there's, there's a, you know, a whole long story there that I don't know if we have time to go into. Uh, you tell us. <laughs> We, we're here for how long you want to be here. <laughs> okay. Um, in the original uh, outline of ElfQuest, um, you know, uh, two thirds of the way through, the Wolf Riders were going to get involved in a major battle with some very nasty trolls. And in that battle, Wendy thought it was totally unrealistic that everybody makes it out alive. Mm -hmm. So in that battle, the character of one eye gets conked on the head and falls down and is dead. And at that time, in my own evolution as a co-creator and story editor and, you know, helper, um, I was so invested emotionally in these characters <laughs> that I just, no, I don't want to see any of them die. I like them all. <laughs> um, now I have to take another side. So she was going to kill Skywise very early in the series. I know that was my romantic, you know. <laughs> and I stepped in and said, no, no way, <laughs> no way. He's an astronomer elf. I'm an astronomer by uh, avocation. Uh, no, he <laughs> lives. Anyway, one eye is dead but i i just couldn't accept that and we had some long running mm. rollicking discussions about mm -hmm. that um and came up with i don't think you liked it very much but i was okay with it came up with the idea that he was on on death's door mm -hmm. but we have this thing called rap stuff and if you're cocooned in it you go into suspended animation, time stops. But here's why it made sense. Uh, and it made so much sense for the development of Lita's character. Right. Because Lita as a healer had a total antipathy at the time against death. She considered death her enemy. And as long as she had the power to save someone's life, she was gonna do it, even right. if it was a troll. And it was a hard lesson for her to learn that sometimes you just have to accept death as part of life. So she works, we have her in the story, work and work and work to save one eye. And she, ke she keeps him from totally leaving his body. And then he gets put in suspended animation. And it's terrible. Right. It's awful because he doesn't get to die. He was, right. he was ready but he doesn't get to. Mm -hmm. And so later on in the story, we, we give him his the freedom. freedom. Yeah, yeah. 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 But the thing is that had we not had that discussion between the two right. of us about, I just can't deal with him dying. Mm -hmm. Can we kind of like keep him in the refrigerator for a little while? <laughs> um, if that hadn't happened, then all of these wonderful explorations oh, of yeah. death, of healers, of what it means to have this power, yeah. of what it means to, none of those would have evolved into the story. That's why Elfquest is so organic. We have the foundation, but sometimes we get to take some very, very interesting mm -hmm. side trips that enrich the story tremendously. And another thing that we're still excited about after all these years is the fact that we set limits on the character's powers. Right. You know, Superman bothers me. <laughs> he really bothers me. I, just, I wouldn't begin to know how to write a character like Superman. I just wouldn't. But by having characters with powers that, and yet their powers are limited, um, Lita is a healer, but there, there are some healings that not even she can achieve right. in the story. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's all sorts of factors as to why, uh, Red Lance is a plant shaper, but his powers had to grow. They started out very small and then, uh, he had to learn 
and gain control over what he could do, and so on and so forth with all our powered characters. Uh, the world of Two Moons itself puts a limit on the energies of these elves, and that's why they, they struggle to survive and have to learn just the basic craft of survival and fighting for your life and hunting and gathering and all those things. Uh, because they they couldn't just wave a wand and go poof and right. you know here's dinner. <laughs> um, uh, this is not this is how we decided to use magic in our story and magic in quotes, which is in a very limited way so that so that our characters had to work for what they gained and they had to evolve and grow out of what they learned. Uh, ElfQuest is is about learning who you are. And what and and what you can do grows exponentially as you learn about who you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess Skywise that we we learn he learns I guess throughout Skywise's story has always been that sense of I don't want to say run away. That's not the yes, term. yes, yes. But run away sounds pejorative. I don't mean. It sounds like it sounds. Uh, sorry, runs. He's an escaper. Escape. There you go. Escaper. I guess He's that's a better. Yeah. And that becomes he has to come to terms with that in, in Stargazer's Hunt to yes. a great degree, which oh was a major. He is, he, he is. It is part of his DNA to have wanderlust. He is an explorer, <laughs> and um, it is it is just fundamental to who he is. Mm -hmm. But he also has relationships that are right. very very important, even to the point of necessity, mm -hmm. to him. And how do you balance those two seemingly conflicting? impulses um and this sometimes is... sometimes one may predominate to the uh, uh um and that that has a bad effect on the other mm -hmm. right um well this is where we got to examine the nature of love itself because what we've learned over the years is that love allows even to the point of letting go, you know, uh, that, that old, uh, trope about, you know, if you love something, set it free. And if it comes back to you, it's yours, you know, right. We don't even take it that far. If you love something, just set it free. <laughs> you know? Uh, whether it comes back or not, you don't even worry about that. Um, yeah, and and these are these are uh, uh, both uh, uncommon, I think, and personal explorations because mm -hmm. we are the characters mm -hmm. uh, that we ourselves have over a long relationship come to examine and look at, and sometimes uh, argue about, and sometimes. Uh, find solutions about um, ElfQuest. We have always said is is to greater or lesser extent autobiographical. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> directly so, and sometimes really, really metaphorically so. And we leave it to the readers to figure out which ones are which. And um, but this was an exploration of as you just uh, said he does have it in him i don't think he considers it running away that's why i was i don't want to but say running away he, yet. he does just take the notion to up and go sometimes for reasons that seem perfectly reasonable and 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 uh, acceptable, and then there are consequences, and sometimes those consequences mm -hmm. are minor, and sometimes they're major. But those in the story who love him the most, his daughter Jink and 
his life mate to Maine, both of them let him know it's okay. Right. We we don't have those expectations of you. If you want to go, go. If you come back, fine. We're going to be fine <laughs> no As matter well. what. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, that's a rather, you know, if, if you think about it, that's that's a pretty heavenly kind of freedom to have. And the challenge of ElfQuest to every one of its readers is simply this. The elves are metaphors. Mm. They are symbols. They represent our ourselves when we are being the best we can be, when we are treating others the best we can treat others. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the elves are immortal. They have very long lifespans. The wolf riders don't, but they still can live for hundreds of years. We are human beings. We're here for a span, whether it's, you know, 30 or 70 or 100 years. It's awful short. It is, by comparison, awfully short. The mm. challenge that ElfQuest presents to the readers is, all right, it would be nice if we could be telepathic. It would be nice if we could live for hundreds of years. It would be nice if we could do things with our mind that the elves can do, but we can't. So how do we as human beings achieve as close as we can to the, in quotes, ideal of the elves being who and what we are here and now. And, and what we arrived at is the simple philosophy. It's not a religion. It's just, it's just, a, just a code, a way of life, which is let's go forth and treat each other as well as we can. You know, nobody in this story is out to be a superhero or out to tell or a messiah uh, or a messiah or out to tell others how to live i mean a uh, cutter especially that's the last thing he ever wanted was was to tell anybody how they should do their life um so just go forth and treat others as well as you can and if they're if they're hostile to you if they if they want to take you out well deal with it but but don't hate you know, just just deal. Mm -hmm. And when you can be good to each other, you know, that that's, that's the main message of the story. That reminds me of one of the most misunderstood in my mind phrases, which applies to ElfQuest as well, I believe. For all ages. Uh, um, or Star Trek, Star Trek, the movie, the very first one from 1970, whatever, 1979, yeah. G rated. Mm -hmm. because general audiences for all ages shouldn't mean anything beyond the fact that it is for all ages. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is always gets me about ElfQuest that you guys have this story that is for all ages, but it's not mm -hmm. what people think of that word now, that phrase now. Mm -hmm. We, you know, from the very beginning, we knew that ElfQuest was going to be, and I hate to word, use the word mature because that carries connotations these yes. days. No, but it's a good word. Uh, yes, in, in the best of all possible senses. People since the beginning have asked us, what's a good age to start reading ElfQuest? And for a long time, we have said, oh, you know, 10, 11, 12, because we would get mail from 10, 11, 12 year olds saying, I really enjoyed it and so on and so forth. We knew that some of the concepts and some of the depictions, some of the content, some of the content mm. uh, was not for younger than that. And mm -hmm. What we have come these days to tell people, say, we still say, you know, 10 or 11 or 12, especially because 10, 11, 12 now is more used to <laughs> oh, yeah. a lot of stuff that 10, 11 and 12 when I was 10 <laughs> now. Mm -hmm. um, but we add to that, listen, if you are a parent of a child who's 
seven and that child is interested in ElfQuest and you as that child's parent think that they are okay if you sit and read with them and, and help them through interpret some of the parts, mm -hmm. go for it. Mm -hmm. There are some people out there who are in their you know, later years <laughs> who probably can't handle ElfQuest. So it's, <laughs> it, yeah. it's not read at your own risk by any means, but, but be informed. No, and it's a it's a cross generational thing. You know, we we get uh, grandparents coming up to us with their grandchildren, saying, "Oh my God!" They say they say, oh, "I I grew up reading ElfQuest, and and uh, I gave it to my kids. I gave it to my kids, and now my, my kids." kids. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. It crosses generations, and um, some of them that come up to us bring very little ones, and and a five year old will say, "Oh." Lita. So they know the characters and, and I think they're just kind of spoon feeding the story to them at a very early age. We're very trusting <laughs> of our audience. Uh, yeah. We trust them to, as Wendy said, treat themselves or treat others the best way they can, even in sharing ElfQuest. Mm -hmm. Because we think the reader knows best. Mm -hmm. Every reader knows best what's what's uh, what's uh, appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything in its own time. Mm -hmm. If you're not ready for ElfQuest now, you might be ready later. You might never be ready. You know. It's I wonder. I was just wondering. With you mentioned Sunny being such yeah. a Skywise fan. Yeah. So is it ever, is it almost, is it weird being almost outnumbered then? Out, oh, <laughs> because two Skywise lovers. <laughs> well, yeah, but they, they. But there's only one Skywise. Uh, there's only one Skywise. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of fans love Skywise. A lot of fans love, say he's their favorite character. And we suspect and have for years that, it's because of that very footloose and fancy free mm -hmm. nature. The sidekick is, is almost always more popular than the hero. Plus he doesn't have the responsibilities that mm -hmm. the chief has and all of that kind of thing. Another reason that Stargazer's Hunt exists is to show that footloose and fancy free isn't always the uh, wonderful uh, attractive thing that you think it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That great moment where he speaks to Cutter essentially, yes. was I good enough? Was I, yes. did I let you down? That's it. Yes. That idea of letting people down constantly is in his mind, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And who hasn't had someone they've loved right. pass over and who hasn't said that? to their loved one, you know. Could I have done more? Could I have done more? Uh, it's universal. And I, I just love what Cutter says. He says, hit, hug, all the same. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I, kinda, I, I think that's what it is. Yeah. You go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to say what a fascinating aspect of Stargazer's quest, which I just... It's got to be for you, looking back, the art, what you could do with art 45 years later, what mm. Sonny can do with Photoshop and oh colors, it's got to be <laughs> mind-blowing compared to what you guys used to be. She, I'm going to tell on her. Yeah. Oh, um, oh I think I know what he's going to say. Um, <laughs> for much of its life, ElfQuest was done the traditional way, you know, pencil right. sketch and then ink. And then it would be sent off to be colored by somebody else on, on stats. Um, Wendy has always, from, I guess, your beginnings as an artist, you have always said that you wanted to paint with light. I had a fantasy about being able to, I don't know, wave a brush and have light particles come out of it like a fairy, you know, and... <laughs> 
just make colors and shapes. So, you know, from 1978 through the late 1990s, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Wendy would draw the traditional way. And then we became a computerized office. And uh, because I was publishing newsletters, I went toward the Mac because the Mac had PageMaker, which was a an early page layout thing. So it became a fully Mac office. Mm. At some point, the word Photoshop got introduced into my vocabulary. <laughs> I said, you should have Photoshop. I don't know what a Photoshop is, but I'm going to get it. So I put it on my computer and I and I fought with it. I hated it. I couldn't make it work. I couldn't do anything. I put it on her computer. <laughs> and using a mouse inside of 15 minutes, she had done this gorgeous full color portrait of Winnowill, one of our best characters, using a mouse and this application that I was hating. And I said, okay, that's going to define our creative relationship for the rest of time. Well, Photoshop is what I, well, I've, I, I've come peace with it, but you have graduated well, from mice. Let me take it from, from here. Um, Let's just say I took to it. <laughs> now, at that time, and this was the early 2000s, Sonny was working with me in my studio as my apprentice and, right. and already assisting me with the art. And uh, so I took to Photoshop. He would come in and watch me and be amazed. But he... He said, "Oh no, no! I, I, I just want to keep working traditionally. I just can't, I just can't get with this." And I kept encouraging him and encouraging him. And finally, finally, he tried it and he started to acquire his own equipment. And my God, you know, <laughs> he just, he, you know, he absolutely surpassed the teacher. Um, oh no, let's he, not. Uh, he, he and I are going to argue about this, but Sonny knows how to do stuff that I, you know, I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> you compliment each other. We but do. Don't, don't, don't say it. See, yeah. there. Oh, this one. This, this here's, here's an example. Yeah. And I'm going to, I hope this. Translate. All right. That double page. All right. I think well, I'm not covering anybody up. Yeah. This is a double page spread that you. I, I, How did this come to be? I outlined this and I did the what's called the color flats for it, okay. which means I, I simply flatted in uh, colors that had no molding or sh shading on right. them at all. Okay. This went to Sonny and I said to him, I want you to turn this into the, the most gorgeous, romantic, sloppy <laughs> anime poster anyone ever painted. And look what he delivered. I mean, you know, <laughs> he knew what I was talking about and, and there it is. So, <laughs> um, it's been a very beneficial partnership. Yeah. Uh, digital. I love, I love working digitally and it's especially kind for deadlines right, because if you're working on a page and you spill a bottle of ink on it, <laughs> you're going to have to start all over again. There's no rescuing it. You screw up in Photoshop and Photoshop has this wonderful thing <laughs> called history. You can go back through it, go to any layer that you were on and you can recapture and go on from there. Um, now, now the interesting thing <laughs> is having completed Stargazer's Hunt and now I'm going to be that tease that we talked about earlier. <laughs> Mm. There are plans and movements afoot mm. at Warp Central here. Uh, Wendy is casting her eye on uh, doing more artwork, but going back to traditional I have roots. I have been. I have a workshop. I, I share a space with Richard in his office. And uh, I have my own workshop and my drafting table and all the stuff I've worked with since I was 16 years old. 
<laughs> and I'm going back to these wonderful tools, these brushes and paints wow. and and pastels and and I'm um, I'm getting used to the feel of how it is to get my hands dirty again <laughs> with uh, with my art materials. But it's it's a kind of a desire to go back and and see what I can do with more traditional mediums um, because there there are certain things you can bring out certain textures you can bring out with traditional mediums that that digital doesn't quite capture because digital is meant to be slick it's right. let's face it it's slick and AI takes that to the nth degree you'll never you'll never see me involved with that right. but um, uh, you know, and so so these days in these in these cold winter days where we're going to be kind of <laughs> housebound, uh, I'm going to be at my drafting table e experimenting with textures and uh, tight detail and things that I haven't necessarily been able to do quite the same way with digital. Interesting. Mm. And what of course, I following through with the hints that we put into Stargazer's Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's a cool bit in the collection that shows some of the the behind the scenes. Yeah. Some of the looser layouts versus the tighter. Yeah. When occasionally it's an important page and needs to go tighter. It's yeah. very informative. Well, thank you. I love that stuff as an archivist, as, as the archivist for ElfQuest since the beginning. I save every scrap of paper that she puts a mark onto. <laughs> um, and, and there are two reasons for that. One is I just love having it and looking at it and seeing the evolution of a page, for example. And two, um, all of the art and all of our papers and so on and so forth are going to the archive at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. So the more I keep, the more we have, and the more students and artists and whoever wants to in the future, if they want to look at the process of ElfQuest or how Wendy developed as an artist, all of that stuff is going to be available long after we're not. Mm -hmm. Let's just leave it that way. Yeah. And, and that is a very peaceful feeling to have. It's funny, you mentioned way a while back about the idea of ElfQuest when it started out, how it appealed to the idea of marginalized uh, LGBTQ, yes. women, uh, women uh, readers for a while. It's got to be a fascinating journey for you, Wendy, to go from the early 80s when a female comic book artist was not a novelty because obviously there had been plenty, but to that same level, like I remember they see Colleen Doran when she was doing her independent stuff. There is no, there's no guidebook on how to publish. There's no guidebook to be an independent female comic book artist in an era when no one else was doing it. And it's got to be fascinating to be now 45 years later and have a whole gen multiple generations where it is no longer Oh my God, a female comic book artist. Well, oddly enough, to some rather backward sorts, <laughs> there still is that element of, oh, you know, but. Um, How dare you? That I, I will have to say that cert certain kinds of fanboys haven't changed since the 70s at all. It, it, they are remarkably consistent. <laughs> and resist. But fortunately, I think they're kind of in the minority and women women have found a place in the industry. They're certainly not dominating the industry and they still have certain struggles that they go through, yes. uh, that the men have more privileges. We have to acknowledge that it's still pretty much a man's industry. Right. Uh, but women are, are standing up for themselves more. They know how to do it better now and they are helping each other and they are providing different avenues for uh, expressing their creativity that didn't exist before. And the internet is an amazing leveler. I bet. You know, women women are starting up their own websites and putting their independent properties up. 
They're launching their ideas online first and developing an audience that way. Then they're being discovered online and then they're getting hired. I mean, this, this is the new journey now. And it's, um, it, it, gender doesn't quite matter uh, as much as it did. Um, I love it. I mean, you know, yep. I have to say that my journey through all of this has been blessed. I, for some reason, have generally 90% not had to go through the struggles that a lot of women wanting to break into the industry in the 80s, 90s, and onward have had to go through. Of course, let me point to this source of help and inspiration and uh, uh, facilitation. Facilitation is the word I was looking for. <laughs> I, I had a great partner, a great facilitator. Um, and that's why you're inter interviewing us as this Tucson dynamic duo. Dynamic <laughs> duo. <laughs> um, so my journey was blessed that way. My journey was also blessed because I had established my reputation as a professional artist 10 years before right. I got known in comics. And, and so there wasn't this, um, constant challenge to me, you know, it was, it was like, uh, people, you know, would say, Oh yeah, I've heard of you. You're famous. You know, I mean, you know, I had that advantage. Um, and yeah. even, even the whole red Sonia experience led to my first professional work in comics because, uh, doing the traveling show with Frank Thorne and Richard right. is our, our special effects person. Um, Eventually, Roy, that led to Roy Thomas in, uh, inviting me to write an issue of Red Sonia, and that was my first professional work in comics. Wow! So, so my my road through all of this has been kind of blessed. Well, I was just I was just thinking as you were as you were talking there, uh, you did build up a reputation in science fiction and fantasy as an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you you. You've been drawing since the age of two. Oh yeah, and I can prove <laughs> it. Um, but there was a little element of because you were a rarity in science fiction fandom. There were not that many female no. science fiction fans, yeah. but you <laughs> just has attracted me with the letter in Silver Surfer. You were very talented, and. You were a rarity, a female who was very talented. Mm -hmm. And there were guys in science fiction fandom who wanted for whatever uh, motivation to nurture or... Mostly to own, you know, back... <laughs> to, to own back or then, exploit. Back then, they, you know, they wanted a trophy and they wanted me to fit into certain... A lot of guys were doing Categories. fanzines, yeah. and a lot of guys wanted one of her illustrations yeah. in their fanzines. Mm -hmm. So she got a lot of requests, and she, you know, honed mm -hmm. her craft doing that way, and that led to mm -hmm. bigger and better, and so on. Uh, all of which funneled mm -hmm. into our doing Elf Quest. But here's the thing: here's where I identify with Skywise, because I'm an escape artist. <laughs> you know? If I find myself in a situation where I feel that I'm being mishandled or, or uh, not respected, especially, and that's been very rare, but occasionally, once in a while, um, I'm gone. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and uh, I always had something else to turn to. Um, during, during a period where ElfQuest was optioned by Warner Brothers, uh, this was in 2008, um, and the option was for four years. And during that period, Warner Brothers kind of disappeared on us. They kind of ghosted us, but they said, don't publish anything new of ElfQuest during those four years. I, you know, instead of getting pissed off and feeling oppressed, like, you know, how dare you? I went and did another project, another entirely different project. 
And, you know, that filled up the four years and then ElfQuest came back to us and back we were with, you know, back on track again. So I'm used to just taking it for granted that if I'm in a situation that isn't working for me, I can always turn to something else. It's, it's very hard to tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> so, you know, that's been our experience with Hollywood. It's been our experience with working with different. Hello, what a beauty. Um, it's been our experience working with different publishers in the industry. And uh, so it's it's all been quite an adventure for me. Um, but I, I, I don't have any gripes, not any big ones. What's interesting that I guess that came during the period where DC was doing ElfQuest. And yes. I guess mm -hmm. I should, obviously just an outside observer was not, DC never seemed to quite get ElfQuest the way the Dark Horse it's seemed to. DC, ElfQuest has, has a wonderful, uh, um, resume of partnerships um at the beginning of this uh interview we talked about marvel and dc turning ElfQuest down because it was too peculiar as soon as the original quest was wrapped up in 1984 within a year marvel had come to us and said can we please have a license to reprint and i was more than happy to grant that because one, I love irony, and two, uh, living well is the best revenge. <laughs> and, and but three, three, Marvel got ElfQuest onto newsstands. Sure did. And our audience leapt, you know, tenfold, yeah. grew tenfold. Yeah. Um, and we then continued to do other stories, and in. 2003 or thereabouts, DC uh, contacted us and wanted to do a, a, both a reprint and an original material license. And I was more than happy to do that because mm -hmm. just like Marvel, DC has resources that Warp Graphics doesn't and never will just because of the size. So they did a, a beautiful uh, four volume reprint of the original quest in which Wendy got to digitally paint with mm -hmm. light yeah. the colors that she had already uh, always envisioned. Yeah, to do the and, definitive colors. And, right. yeah. and they also did some uh, original materials. And then the mm -hmm. Warner Brothers hiatus came along uh, and we did not produce original material for uh, a period of four years. That's but when I put the. That's uh, when you put it on the stuff online, mm -hmm. because in the internet age, if you if you're not doing something every day, you get forgotten, you get lost. So I wanted to keep ElfQuest visible, and that's really why I did all that scanning and uploading. And then in 2012, Dark Horse came along, and uh, we have been with them ever since. We're independent. We're not isolationist. <laughs> if somebody brings something good to the table that will help get the story out there, and that's aim number one, getting the story out there, we will sit down at the table and talk with them. Mm -hmm. And that's brought us to this day. Mm -hmm. It's funny we mentioned, obviously, the Warner Brothers. CBR just... A few days ago, uh, one of the writers, Timothy Donahue, talked about how ElfQuest would be a perfect TV adaptation. We, it was we, spectacular. We loved that article. We saw that article. We're sharing it with everyone we know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, from CBR's pages to Spielberg's ear or whatever, uh, you know, choose your choose your uh, your best uh, outcome. No, that was an amazing piece of writing, and we are very grateful. Please pass along our thanks. Oh yeah, and our gratitude. Mm. Um, yeah, that yeah. was that was an, a, a really really good piece. See, we're always in talks with Hollywood. There's never a time when we haven't 
Hollywood hasn't been knock, knock, knock. You know, <laughs> we've always been in one stage or another of relationship with Hollywood. And we are to this day. We don't know where it's going to go. It, you, but, know. you know, the ride is fun. Hope, hope <laughs> springs eternal. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny just thinking back to all the way back to, was it Novena? Is that the name of the? Yeah. The oh, brother. 1981. <laughs> um, rock, rock and rule. Rock and, rule. rock and rule just worked out. <laughs> yeah. And, and that and just worked out. How they, things. They were the first one to come knocking and they demonstrated to us what many since have demonstrated to us, which is the ability to say, we love ElfQuest. And then to show us that they have no idea, no idea what, what it's about. about. Mm -mm. And so you, you gotta, you just gotta keep smiling through that because yeah. otherwise you'll, you'll do damage somehow. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, uh, wrap it up. We should look it back to ElfQuest.com. Okay. What else besides the comic book on there? That site is, is packed with interesting things for fans, Isn't it right? Though? Oh, we <laughs> have. I. It, it, it's not the. It may not be the very first, um, but it is certainly one of the very first uh, top level domains devoted to a single comic book property. Uh, we, we got ElfQuest.com in the mid-1990s. Um, somebody who was working for us said, you really should get this website, ElfQuest.com. I said, what's a website? <laughs> I had no clue. But there has been an ElfQuest.com, well, it's going to be, what, 30 years next year? Yeah. And... Um, it has undergone four or five renovations, renovations, evolutions. And uh, the most recent one is just about a year, year and a half old. Um, the thing that, again, uh, I am most proud of is the what we call the reading room, where you can go right to the home page, click on a button, go to our library, and then just spend hours and hours reading all of the ElfQuest comics up to uh, 2013. But there's a lot, lot more. Uh, uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Behind the scenes uh, character designs and character profiles. There's, there's a who's who mm -hmm. of hundreds and hundreds of characters. There's fun stuff like all videos, of the connections to videos. Uh, uh, there's 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 cartoons, cartoons. Uh, uh, that you did. Uh, there's uh, tributes, tributes and homages uh, over the years. ElfQuest has been, uh, um, you know, had hat tips or parodies or, um, you know, the only thing I can say is just go to ElfQuest.com and navigate. Mm -hmm through the top menu bar and the drop down menus, just, you know, sit back and have fun because we wanted the site to be easy to use and we wanted it to be fun. And we think we have, we have done that. And uh, it continues to be a source of pride. And I think that's the best thing about it. For me personally. Yeah, well, it was your baby. Well, somebody had to do it. Somebody <laughs> had to publish ElfQuest. We did it. Yeah. You know? Oh, I'm also, you know, one of the hats I wear is I, IT, uh, <laughs> IT tech, uh, <laughs> tech support. So I maintain the, the website as well. Yeah. Um, so we each wear a lot of different hats. Excellent. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming out. And wow, we've covered a lot of great material. Thank you so much. I think this is going to be one of our favorite interviews. And we want to thank you very much. Especially, I love the conversation about Stargazer's Hunt. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. That was a great, uh, great book to read. Thank you. Not final. Not final, <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, guys, thank you. All right, thank you.